This is part three of a three-part episode. This episode should be valuable even if you didn't listen to part one and part two. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back, Anthony. Uh, We have been on a roll here talking about your story in in part one. Some really great tips on Detroit-style pizza and dough management in part two, and I suggest everyone listen to those two parts. But right now, we're going to talk about one of your expertise outside of food, which is photography. And to catch everyone up in case they haven't listened to the first part, you were a photographer for a number of years doing wedding and architectural photography before opening your restaurant business. Does that pretty much sum it up for the people listening? Yeah, I'd say so. Awesome. Awesome. And so let me just give you the floor. How do you approach photography and food? You know, that's something that I feel like I can always be getting better at, despite someone like you or a lot of people tell me our Instagram looks wonderful. Photographing food and making it look as enjoyable as possible is relatively easy. It's just about finding the right light and finding the right angle and just letting the plating or whatever shine. I usually just make a dish how I normally would, and then I'll bring it by the front door, or sometimes I'll just walk it outside. You get some nice, soft, reflective light coming in, and then nothing more than just the newest iPhone or whatever takes really wonderful pictures of these things. When you say soft, reflective light, are you using anything other than the sun? I I got a little confused there. Do you have something bouncing light, or is it just like literally outside and taking take a photo right then and there sometimes it'll be nothing more than just the window light itself also sometimes you need to get a little fill of your shadows and what i like to do is we have just generic white pizza boxes so i'll just take an unfolded pizza box i'll hold it in my hand or i'll just prop it next to the food item like right here to kind of fill in once in a while i use a little battery operated light to kind of fill but otherwise it's really just bouncing lights or like when i walk outside i can see that the front of my building's in shadow right now so that's just a really great opportunity to have just a nice even consistent light coming across as opposed to harsh directional light that overhead lights or direct sunlight creates. Yeah, it's so interesting. What a difference it makes on your food when you take it outside. And I started noticing that last summer when I was outside baking, it's a poor measurement, but I noticed a spike on my Instagram engagement as soon as I started posting pictures of my pizza outside. It was ridiculous. And I think it just, I guess, makes the food look more appealing. Why do you think that is? It might look more appealing. It might just be that nice natural light. I don't know if you're getting pops of green in there, but for me, I like pops of green on my food or I like pops of green as a background. So, you know, sometimes I like to take, say, like a slice or something. For whatever reason, I love the aesthetic of a slice on a white paper plate. And then if you add a background behind that, like say grass or something like, or brick or something just really substantial as that next layer. I think that looks really good. I mean, truthfully. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Adding a couple little touches goes a long way, like grass or brick. Giving it different dimensions or different layers. Different dimensions. Even, even if you're even if you're looking straight at something, that's why I don't love like say a straight down or what you call it, like a lay flat where you're just looking straight above the food. Someone who I think does this really well is Chris Decker from Metro Pizza, he loves to like put food off of a counter. And so he is like taking a photo of the food dish. And then because it's on the counter, but halfway, and then there's more under it, you're creating these different layers, which I think is more captivating than just straight on the counter or something. Chris also has some beautiful pizzas just to begin with. He does. He uses so many different ingredients and colors, like what you were talking about earlier about adding in a hint of green there. I mean, this guy is the micro veg king sometimes. I'm just like, what are you using, bro? That looks tight. Yep, yep. (laughs) He's a true magician when it comes to making beautiful looking pizzas. He's incredible. One of the things that I see on your Instagram page is you have a lot of post bake goodies that go on your pizza. And and I think that adds, is is the word volume to a pizza? Because pizza can be pretty flat, not Detroit style pizza, but even then a Detroit style pizza, just a slice could look pretty flat in some cases. You know, we are huge on adding stuff like ricotta, burrata, hot honey, fresh basil, infused oils. Some of our pizzas get 
finish with sauce or, you know, there was one I just ran that was a take on a Nashville hot chicken pizza that got just chicken and cheese. And then that got finished with sauce and pickles. So like, I like adding a lot of things post bake, And I think that's one of the things that sets us apart a little bit and also helps create a more captivating pizza is you have these different textures. You have hot and cold, you have different heights, you have different volumes, you have splashes of green with the basil. And we do a lot of grated parm too. So like, cause every pizza gets grated parm more or less. And then most of them get another sauce or an oil or basil. So you got at least two or three layers minimum on top of whatever was baked on. So yeah, I think that helps a lot with the presentation and just being more captivating of a menu item. Yeah. And, and taste too. Boiled down. It comes down to texture and taste. And how do you stand out from the chain pizzeria that just does cheese or pepperoni? Is you have something contrasting your pizza that is memorable and, and looks so photogenic and shareable. Right. Absolutely. Also for the audience, I'm a huge fan of cold tomatoes on a pizza. I used to work at a pizzeria in 2018 and the owner was talking to me about one of the pizzas. It was a franchise. And so he was like, oh yeah, this pizza, I don't like it too much because the tomatoes, when you cook them down in the oven, they kind of just taste like water, like sweet water. And maybe it wasn't sweet because the tomatoes he was using weren't that great sometimes. (laughs) But if you, what he told me was if you you know, reserve the tomatoes for post-bake, you get a little bit more of that flavor in it and you get the cold and the warm play that goes on there. And so I've been a fan of that. So for anyone thinking about how to use tomatoes, try that out. That's a cool idea. I like that. Never thought of that. (laughs) There you go. We're sharing ideas here. Are you the type of listener that wants more content? Do you have suggestions for the type of content that's being made? Maybe you're the type of person who wants to support me as a creator. Well, I'm here to announce that I have started a Patreon. A number of you have been asking about this ever since I started podcasting in 2020. And I'm finally committing to the process of creating a Patreon. I want to create some episodes that are raw, unedited, give my thoughts. I also want to provide bonus content from the episodes that didn't make the final cut. And finally, I want to just have open communication with the listeners. And I promise that if you reach out to me via the Patreon, I'll get back to you as soon as possible because I know you're going the extra mile to support me and therefore I'll go the extra mile to support you. So whether you're interested in more content from me or you just want to support the team over at What's Good Dough, check out the link to my Patreon in the show notes. I'd greatly appreciate it if you signed up. Thank you so, so much for supporting me. What other uh, food photography skills can you share for the pizza Instagrammer, the restaurateur, anything like that? And what, what I love so far is that you're making food photography extremely accessible when it comes to just using your iPhone, using what you have, a pizza box, all of that. What other tips do you have for us? Yeah, just using what you have and making the most of it. You know, these iPhones, they have a beautiful portrait mode that works super, super well. All you need to do really is just find some nice soft window light, nice shadowy area possibly, and then just a way to create layers or dimensions. I mean, honestly, it's as simple as that. And then from there, the sky is the limit on how you interpret that. Photography is super subjective, but just starting with those couple core, I don't want to say rules, but those are great places to start to lead to more or less an easy path to success with that. Okay. Now I understand your Instagram is mainly your phone, but is everything on your website also phone pictures too? It's not. A lot of our more professional, like super, like anything you can tell was probably taken with like a DSLR is actually from a food photographer that I used to work very close with doing photography. He's incredibly talented. I plan to hire him at least twice this year to do large rounds of marketing stuff because when it comes to photography And my own food at that level, I'm a little too picky. I'm my worst critic and I can't objectively take high level photography like that and also not drive it into the ground and take the, you know, make the wheels fall off of that project. So I do hire out professional photography from time to time just so I can get some different set of eyes on stuff. And I'm very happy to have a huge array of people to 
call on because I, I got to meet some very talented people when I was in the photography industry and got to make some really good friends. So I like to give them work when I can. I'm so glad you mentioned that because with my team who is producing this podcast, I found that I'm the bottleneck. I am striving for perfection. I'm thinking I can do it all. But the reality is there are people out there who can do far better work. And there are people out there who can get the process going much more efficiently and maybe have a little bit less emotion to it all. Because if I'm editing the podcast, I need to be perfect, perfect, perfect. But if I have people checking out the podcast and editing it for me and reviewing it, I know it's going to be good enough. It's just my pickiness. Uh, so I, I would like to add that uh, just as a quick aside. But for those people who are thinking about hiring a food photographer, what should they look out for? And what's a good budget for a reasonable expectation for people? You're going to want to find someone that can do the style you're looking for. I think that Again, food photography is so subjective, but I have like there's certain Instagram accounts and certain aesthetics that I love. And then I'll look for photographers that I personally know that can execute work like that. But if you don't ask for samples, ask for recommendations, ask for that kind of like upfront knowledge before you hire them. And then food photography I truthfully don't know where the market is at. I think my friend gives me a very affordable rate. But in general, when I was doing photography several years ago, and it probably translates to now, you always get what you pay for. If you're going to find someone that'll do it for 100, 200 bucks, probably not going to be super great, if I'm being honest. I have no issue paying 500 to 1,000 bucks for someone to do good work, and I'll get maybe a few hundred lightly colored grade photos out of that. When you get into the neighborhood of 1,000 plus, and the number of photos you're getting goes down, you're probably getting into the wrong kind of territory, in my opinion. You can charge whatever you want and you always get what you pay for. But in general, a couple hundred bucks, 500 bucks, thousand bucks, if they're going to spend four to six to eight hours with you is probably my cap for food photography without going to a studio or something. If they're coming to you, going to do it in your restaurant, I wouldn't charge much more than that or hire someone for much more than that. So basically there's a range that you should be looking at. Too cheap, no go. Too high, no go. Find the sweet spot in the middle. But more importantly, think of the end in mind and work backwards from that. What do you want it to look like and find people who can execute on that? Yeah, totally. Maybe one of my final questions for you is what does that shooting day look like? And also for people, one more quick thought is that the color grading part of it also takes time too. So factor that into your thought process of how much you should be paying because they're not just going to spend a few hours taking photos of the food. They're actually editing it, making it the right color, all of that stuff too, right? As a rule of thumb, when I was doing photography, any form of photography, for every one hour I am somewhere, I'm spending two to three hours on the back end, always, without fail. Doesn't matter what style of anything it was. So just bear that in mind. When someone tries to charge you 300 bucks for three hours, they're not just getting 300 bucks for three hours, they're charging you for nine, 10 hours. It's just not what you see. Picture this, a new family moves into your neighborhood. What does that mean for you? A potential new customer. What better way to introduce yourself than with free pizza? Here's how. Our Town America works with businesses like yours to craft irresistible welcome packages to anyone who moves into your neighborhood. If you listen to my podcast with Christina Martin of Manitza's Pizza, she uses this same tactic and oh my goodness, she's raking in the customers who naturally become diehard fans of her business. So if this is something you want to get started on, you got to get with Susan from Our Town America. Let her know you heard about her from What's Good Dough. That way, you can save $125 if you get set up. I got you, fam. You can reach her at 480-678-1366. Again, that's Susan from Our Town America. 480-678-1366. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. The day of your shoot, are you making a pizza, shoot it, make a pizza, shoot it, and then they get to take it home? <laughs> tell me about tell me about the day, uh, just to give people an understanding of what it looks like. Yeah, pretty much. The days I've done it, I probably had this in mind because A, I know the industry, and B, I'm just a huge planner, but I would make a spreadsheet of everything I wanted to shoot, 
I would prep everything ahead of time, make sure I had everything ready because when those people show up, time is money. And when you got someone there, you want to be efficient and you got to get back to what you're doing too. So I would do as much as I could in the preparation. We would take some time assembling, you know, because I wanted shots of the pizzas being assembled, pre-bake, finishing, post-bake, and then final photography. Just be adaptable and be able to kind of go with things. And you're not going to get everything that you wanted. So prioritize things like in four hours, you're not going to photograph 25 pizzas. You know what I mean? Like be happy if you get to five because everything takes longer than you think, especially in production. So just be as planned as possible, have everything ready, and then just be willing to pivot and adapt and make changes on the fly and not be married to whatever idea you thought you had going into it because you have to change things sometimes. Beautiful. What a great piece of advice. And Truly a great conversation about food photography. Anthony, is there any final closing thoughts uh, just to wrap up this this section of the conversation? No, I think we kind of covered a lot on food photography, truthfully. My final two questions for you. What's one mistake in pizza, business, or life uh, that people should avoid? Man, that is a good question. The one mistake that I would try to avoid kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier. Be willing to try things and make mistakes because the whole thing is a learning journey, especially when you start a business. You don't really know what you're doing and you need to be able to make mistakes so you can learn. People have to earn your trust, but also trust people to get the job done for you. Try different things with your food product and make those mistakes so you know what you got or what to avoid. I don't think there's one specific thing I can think of, but just in general, that's something that I would preach because you're not going to get better if you don't make mistakes or have these instances happen and grow from them. The mistake is to not make mistakes. The mistake is to not do anything and because you're so scared of making mistakes. Great advice. Always a great reminder. What do you want to leave the audience with today? Final question. I kind of would just again tell anyone to go for what they want to do and you know whether your passion is I'm sure pizza but even if not just try and do what you want to do and find your happiness and food is something that makes me happy and sharing what I've learned and creating what I've learned to people that I don't even know and helping them create memories fills my bucket and that's what I set out to do, not knowing how I would get there and how it would happen and what it would look like. But just I've enjoyed the journey that I've been on. And I've been fortunate to meet people like you and and get to talk to other people and make connections, make friends, you know, build relationships, while also sharing the love of food and running a restaurant. If I wouldn't have tried this and put myself out there, who knows where I'd be right now, two years ago. So just try. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey with me. And and thank you for being on this journey because it's always inspiring to hear people go out of their comfort zone and do the thing that they're supposed to be doing and spreading that joy and love of food with others. I I appreciate your work and I, I can't wait to keep up with your pizza journey. Thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the What's Good Dope podcast. Make sure to check out the show notes where you'll find links to my Patreon, email list, and the links to all my sponsors. You'll also find the contact info for today's guest too. Before we sign off today, I'd love it if you could support me by rating and reviewing this show. It helps so much when it comes to growing the show. Also, please share this episode with a friend, family member, or fellow pizza baker, especially if you think it'll add value to their lives. You can copy the link to this podcast and send it on over to them, or you can even share it via social media. If you do that, please tag me. I'd greatly appreciate it. Last but not least, I'd love it if you subscribe to the show. That way you can get notified anytime there's a new podcast. I appreciate you for listening. I love you. Till next time. Peace. Hey, home pizza makers. What's good, dough? It's time for you and me to partner up together and make pizzas for good. How do we do that? You and I will be doing pizza parties nationwide to raise money for Slice Out Hunger. And yes, it is starting now. So if you want to be a part of my team and make pizzas for good, you can register to be a part of Team What's Good Dough. And yes, it is welcome to all bakers, whether you're just starting off or you're a seasoned pop-up pro. Let's make pizza for good together. How's it going, pizza pal? I just want to let everyone know that I started an email list. Why? Because I recognize that time is more important than ever, especially after being a dad. And I realize that content is abundant 
and sometimes we just can't get to listening to a podcast. And so what I want to do is send out a weekly newsletter highlighting some of the key topics that we discussed in the podcast. I hope to save you a bunch of time. So please do sign up for this email list. There's going to be a link in the show notes. I truly appreciate it. And I hope I can save you some time. So thank you in advance for signing up for that email newsletter.